everybody. We'll get started here. Uh, I'm Jimmy Stone. I'm from uh, F and O, and so I've had the privilege today of introducing Jamie. I'll get to that in a minute. But first, uh, let me thank all of you all for coming and the, the topic what we're going to look at today. I'm going to stick around for probably for about an hour, and then I'm going to have to leave before it's over. If not, I told Jamie she can handle it. But Teresa Nichols and some folks. Uh, I don't know. This thing is put on every year. We put on from the Sustainable Campus Initiative. And I don't know how many of y'all know about that, but it's a initiative started back in about 2008. And we have a, a lot of work going on, not just from the energy efficiency stuff, but also including landscaping. And, you know, we try to promote things like uh, using the bus. There's a bus now, you know, that travels also from UT out here and back. And so it works pretty good stopping at Tulsa City. Bryce is in the room here, does a lot of energy efficiency stuff out here where we basically try to save as much energy as we can. We've done a pretty good job of that over the years, and we continue to do that. But the Sustainable Campus Initiative Teresa and Melissa Lapsa head up for us. Uh, we fund it out of FNO, but we turn it over to the researchers, and so all of our folks work well together to try to make sure that the lab, um, you know, is sustainable either in landscaping or energy efficiencies or in the way we manage our facilities or whatever, and also the way we manage our waste. So we're trying everything. We've got about 28 roadmaps. If you want to go look at that, you can go to the Sustainable Campus Initiative website and see what we're doing there. If you want to join in and help us, we'll be glad to get any help we can. There's lots of things that folks can do to help us do things around here. You know, every amount of money that we save uh, is going more towards the research, which is the mission we're trying to get done here. Uh, I always tell people we're blessed to have the job that we have. I really believe that here at the lab. It's a blessing. We have a tremendous place to work and people we get to work with and the place that we get to work, work at. I mean, how much can you better beat East Tennessee to work somewhere like this? And the way that the campus looks, Neil and his team have done a great job of promoting the campus and the way it looks, and we try to approve it every year. So if you got ideas, be sure to let us know. Neil's sitting in here. Where'd he go? Oh, yeah, he's not sitting there. Yeah, he's gone. So look, he I, I talked and he left, right? So anyway, <laughs> you got things. You can see that. So let me do the introduction of Jamie Harrell here. Um, Jamie was with us for about almost a year for as a subcontractor. She's a plant ecologist. Um, she's out of Purdue which I got to tell you, I make a lot of fun of about Purdue because I don't know how many of y'all know John Powell, who happens to be my best friend over at ESNH. I always tell him that Purdue is just a junior college up in West Lafayette. So I wouldn't say that about Jamie. <laughs> I wouldn't say that about Jamie. She's from the other side of the school, which is also is a real full-fledged university. No, just joking. But we've had her now since about September. It was a great hire for us, I got to tell you. If you don't know, Pat Parr left us a few years ago, and Neil and them, Neil moved into Pat's job, and we needed somebody to take over looking at all the things that we do at the laboratory from a sustainability standpoint and off from a plant economy. It was a great hire to get Jamie. I tell you, I'm very pleased with her. I like working with her. She's a great lady, and most of you all will get to know that here in a few minutes. So, again, thank you so much for coming. I'm going to stay for as long as I can, and when i got to get out, Jamie, you can be glad to answer. Mm -hmm. We are being recorded. So if you're not supposed to be here or not supposed to be in the country or something, <laughs> don't show your face on the recordings, okay? But again, thank you all so much for coming. And also, if there's anything I can do to help, you know, like I said, we're in F&O. We're here to help. We're here to enable the mission. The mission is to do research, not to, not to do operations. But if there's anything I can do to help, please call on me to help you. As I always say, if there's something in our staff that we can do to help, give us a call. We're glad to help. We, it takes everybody in this organization to make this place work. It's a big city that we're trying to keep going. So if there's anything we can do to help, please let us know. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jamie. Welcome. Thank you. Give her a round of applause. Here. <laughs> okay. Oh, my mic is on. So as Jimmy said, I am here to talk to you today about butterfly gardens and pollinator habitats, both on the campus and how you can convert those over to your own backyard. And so when I was, there we go, kind of starting out what to talk about today, because there's so many things that I could geek out over about butterflies and pollinators. Um, I asked people, and one of the first things is, what exactly is a pollinator? And yes, that seems like it's going all the way back to maybe elementary school, but we, we have these images of bees and butterflies, and that's kind of where we, a lot of people, kind of draw the line. That, that's what we think of. So just really briefly, I've got to stand back here to get to it. Butterflies, obviously that's in my title. 
butterflies are really excellent pollinators of many of our plant species. Then you've got your bees, and we kind of have this classical image of a black and yellow bee buzzing around our, our honeybees and our bumblebees. The honeybees are actually from Europe, they're not native, but our bumblebees are native. And along with bumblebees, there are over 4,000 uh, native bees in the United States. They may or may not look like your typical yellow and black bee. Uh, this one is a shiny metallic green bee. Wasps, this is a wasp pollinating a orchid. Your moths, a lot of people think moths and butterflies look the same, but they actually go for very different flowers. They are pollinators for very different species. Beetles, on your magnolias, I was just talking about magnolias earlier. Beetles are one of the prime examples for pollinators of magnolia trees. You've got ants, flies, hummingbirds, and also bats, and there aren't bat pollinators here in East Tennessee, but they are important pollinators in other parts of the United States and the world. So why should we care? Why should we care about pollinators? And being a plant person, the first thing that I go to is, well, every reason why we care about plants and every benefit that plants give us is really also a benefit from the pollinators. So things like clean water, the air we breathe, the ability to have soils stay where it is and not get washed into the rivers. All these things we look for in plants. So then aesthetics, what do you like in your yard? What do you like about walking in the Great Smoky Mountains or on the greenways? We all owe that to plants and by that we owe it to pollinators as well. Obviously we don't want to forget about our food and our wood products. Um, obviously those have a very, a, a monetary value, um, but we, we need those and we need pollinators to get those types of products. Oops. And then we have kind of what I'm the most interested in, biodiversity. Without pollinators, we don't have a very big food web and we don't have a lot of wildlife. So the top slot or the top picture here, I have a blueberry. Blueberries are native to the southeastern United States. And we not only like to eat blueberries, but the bears like to eat them, and the birds like to eat them. And herbivores like to eat the leaves, and caterpillars like to eat the leaves, and birds like to eat the caterpillars. And this fact here, I just thought was really neat. If you're, is anybody a birder? I mean, I know some people in here are birders, but 96% of terrestrial birds need insects for their young. Yes, seeds are great, but they need those insects. They need the insects that are also pollinators. And then of course, the very human part, that, oh, it didn't show up there, agriculture. A lot of our food, most of our food needs pollinators. So besides the fact that butterflies are fun to chase around with a net or take pictures of, they serve a very useful purpose to us and to the wildlife. So why are they in trouble? And I'm just going to briefly touch on this. Um, I am not an expert in colony collapse disorder, but there's been a lot in the news and you can find out a lot of research. A lot of things are kind of coming all together in this perfect storm and causing a decline in the European honeybee. You've got loss of flowering plants. Every time we put in a parking lot or a subdivision with turf grass, we lose flowering plants. Global warming. As blooming times shift, flowers may be blooming before the honeybees even come out, and that's a missed opportunity for food. Uh, neonicotinoids are big in the news um, of how they can affect honeybees and also parasites. So like I said, these things are all coming together and kind of making this perfect storm. Now, monarch butterflies, kind of the other poster child for pollinator decline, and the main reason for this is the loss of habitat and the loss of their main food source. Uh, summer breeding, Canada to the Midwest, and even in here in Tennessee, monarchs are looking for breeding habitat. And they are looking specifically for um, milkweed plants to lay their eggs so that their caterpillars can be raised. Then when it starts being fall, they migrate to Mexico and they overwinter there. 
well, that's great, except they're also losing habitat in Mexico. Um, so overall, we're just kind of losing habitat for monarchs all across the board. Uh, and the main part of that is the decrease in milkweed. So while there's all these other parts that are taking uh, play in pollinator decline, in monarch decline, in honeybee decline, what I'm really going to be talking about and focusing on is habitat loss and how we can kind of combat that by planting native plants on campus, uh, in areas, our churches, our schools, our backyards. So first off, why am I pushing native plants? Well, pollinators, native pollinators and native plants have evolved together. There's, they they kind of just fit. And while this example here is actually of a rare plant species out west, it kind of fits the ideal picture of this coevolution. You've got a purple plant with that long, you guys, can you make out the long tube of the flower? And the only thing that can pollinate it is this one insect that also has a very long tongue or proboscis. And so they just kind of fit together. If we lose that insect that has that long tongue, nothing's gonna be able to pollinate that plant. And if that plant disappears, that insect's not gonna have anything to eat. So they've, they've belonged together. And then most pollinators need specific plants. 90% of butterfly and moth larvae, the caterpillars, can only eat a specific plant or a group of plants. So here on, on the left, you have the zebra swallowtail, and that's actually our Tennessee state butterfly, and all they can eat is pawpaws, which is a tree. So if we don't have pawpaws, we don't have the zebra swallowtails, that, that's all there is to it. For the pipe vine swallowtails, they're a little less picky. They will eat Dutchman's pipe vine, woolly Dutchman's pipe vine, and Virginia snake root. So they have a whopping three plants that they'll eat, all of which are native. And then you get to the black swallowtail on the right, and they're less picky still. They'll eat your dill, they'll eat your fennel in your garden, but they also like a lot of the native plants like this golden Alexander. And probably the most famous example is that monarch and milkweed correlation uh, or connection. The monarch will own, caterpillars will only eat the native milkweeds. And then my last reason of why natives are important is because often non-native plants don't provide what is needed for the pollinators. It's kind of like offering a Big Mac, yes, it may give them substance, but it doesn't necessarily make them healthy. But it can get worse than that. Non-native plants can actually make uh, the native butterflies and other pollinators sick. So one of the first things when we started seeing this pollinator push was to plant milkweed. Everybody plant milkweed in your yard. Well, the easiest seeds to get were this tropical milkweed. And the problem with that is it's tropical. It's not native. It has a different bloom time. So it was blooming and still growing, still producing leaves that caterpillars could grow, or butterflies could lay their eggs on and caterpillars could eat long into the fall. And that sounds great, but at some point the monarchs have to stop and they have to migrate. And if they don't, that ends that cycle. So by planting this non-native plant with the best of intentions, we disrupted that cycle. And that not only led to changes in migration, but diseases, et cetera. And it can get even worse. Um, I don't actually know of black swallowwort as a landscaping plant around here. Maybe some of you do. I know in New England it's a common landscaping plant, but it's related to the milkweed. It's not a milkweed, but it's in the same family. And it's not from here. So when a monarch, butterfly, adult females hovering around looking for a plant, it's trying to get these chemicals uh, these chemical signals from the plant of what plant it should lay its eggs on. Since it's never encountered this black swallowwort, it doesn't have that coevolution. it doesn't know that it should not lay its eggs on this plant because it's actually poisonous to the caterpillar, but it smells just like a milkweed. So it's really throwing off, we're, we're ending up 
harming all these monarchs by planting black swallowwort because they just don't know that it's not a milkweed and not good for them. So I realize I'm a little biased. I really like native plants. I'm pushing native landscaping. But I swear, it's not just me who's pushing native plants. You go to all these organizations, and there are plenty that talk about planting zinnias or marigolds or fennel to help pollinators, and, and that's, that's fine. Um, but a lot of these organizations are really pushing native plants. And why is that? Because of all those reasons I, I just mentioned. They, they've co-evolved. They're adapted. The native plants aren't going to make them sick. They know to avoid them or not to avoid them. And all this has gone all the way up to the White House. And in 2014, the president signed a presidential memorandum creating a federal strategy to promote the health of honeybees and other pollinators. And then the next year, uh, a pollinator task force was developed and they came up with a national strategy. And basically what this is looking at is best management practices. How do we help these pollinators that are really declining? So their goals are to reduce honeybee colony losses and increase monarch habitat. And they have numbers associated with it so they can tell if they're reaching their goals. Um, but then their third one is also to restore um, millions of acres, I believe it's seven million acres of federal habitat into pollinator habitat. And that's really where we come in here at Oak Ridge. Department of Energy has over 33,000 acres on what is called the Oak Ridge Reservation. So if anybody's new or not sure what they're all driving through on Bethel Valley, that's part of the Oak Ridge Reservation, going from 95 to Scarborough and from the river all the way up north past the turnpike. And that's grassland, it's forest, it's aquatic habitat. And in this habitat, we have over 1,100 different vascular plant species. So we have a lot to offer these pollinators. And then bringing it in a little bit closer to home where we are now, you've got, you can see the ORNL campus and it's nestled uh, in the ridge line here. And what Sustainable Campus and what uh, the Landscaping Review Committee is really trying to do is kind of bring all those habitats and those ecosystem services and all these natural processes into campus, which helps it become sustainable and helps it uh, become better for pollinators and other wildlife. And it really helps incorporate the lab into this overall 33,000 Oak Ridge Reservation instead of just a concrete slab surrounded by trees. So when the president first signed this memorandum, the natural resources team sat down, came up with how do we evaluate our pollinator habitats? Because that's one of the things. The first step is to evaluate what you have before you can make improvements. So the first thing we did was go out and what do we see? Do we see beetles? Do we see bees? Do we see butterflies? But then we started evaluating the habitat itself. So one of the key things in the memorandum is it, or in the uh, best management practices, is to keep those flowers blooming all growing season. So we're looking for at least three plants blooming throughout the whole growing season. Specifically, we're looking for milkweed, but other pollinator plants or the larval host plants, the pawpaw. You know, anything that we know that one, you know, one specific pollinator might need, we'll go ahead and jot it down. Looking beyond what plants are being eaten or nectared on, we start looking more and more at habitat, uh, hummingbird habitat. This hummingbird has a little bit of a cattail fluff in its beak, and that's what it makes its nest out of. Similarly, a lot, we always think of bees as having beehives, but those 4,000 native bees that I mentioned all have different nesting habitats. Some burrow into the ground, some go into dead twigs that are hollowed out. So we're looking for those types of things. Shaggy bark, insects go up underneath there. And then our native grasses, and that's a big push here, both on campus and on the reservation, is getting these native bunch grasses um, back into the ecosystem. And if you think of something like a turf grass, there's nowhere for an animal, an insect, or any other wildlife to kind of get under there and shelter itself. It's just all flat, no place to hide. 
well, these bunch grasses are bunchy, and then the grass kind of flows over it. So it provides shelter, provides room for them to move about. Other thing, clean water. Now, obviously this water actually looks dirty, but that's good um, because it's with soil. And the soil dispersed in the water helps the butterflies get the minerals that they need. Side note, if you see, this is called puddling. And male butterflies are the ones that are going to be the ones that are puddling. They need to get the minerals from the soil. The females get the minerals from the males during mating. So now you know. The more you know. Uh, stable soil. You don't want a lot of disruption. Like I said, some bees nest in the ground. So you don't want to do a bunch of tilling every single year. It's not only not great for erosion issues, but it disrupts a lot of the natural habitat. And then in general, if a habitat is good for quail or turkey it's pr or deer, it's probably going to be pretty good for pollinators as well. They all tend to like these natural ecosystems as much as possible. So when we were looking at that, we realized that although we don't have a specific best management plan for the Oak Ridge Reservation or for the campus, yet we do have a wildlife management plan we do native grass restoration, we do invasive plant management, and we do forest management. And those are all very beneficial to the pollinators that we have um, in this area. Then we also started participating in what's called Monarch Watch, which is something you guys can all do. Um, it basically, you go to the website, monarchwatch.com or .org, I don't remember, and you order these little stickers. They're about the size of a, an eraser, pencil tip and you go out, catch the butterflies, that's where I have the trouble. Then you have to take pictures and take a little bit of notes and you put the sticker on there and it tells you exactly where to put it and then you release it. And then if somebody catches that monarch again, they take the note, what number it is, they all have an individual number and they take notes and they send that information in and then if it gets to Mexico in the overwintering grounds, they'll let you know. So it's kind of this interesting uh, project to see where, what's happening with the monarchs. Are they getting somewhere and stopping? Are they making it? Are they, are none of them arriving? Um, so it's a neat program and we've just started uh, tagging them in the past couple of years. So that brings us to the ORNL campus. And we, like Jimmy said, are make every effort to be a sustainable campus. And this is kind of, one of my favorite pictures because it highlights our energy efficient buildings and our sustainable native landscaping. And in the front there, I'm sure Bryce could tell you about the building, but in the front there, uh, we've got a bunch of Rebecca herda, which is a great uh, pollinator plant. These are just some more examples of what we do. The Landscaping Review Committee um, there's a couple members here. We're made up of engineers, roads and grounds, ecologists, uh, sustainable campus and water quality folks, and we try to come up with sustainable solutions to campus landscaping. And part of that is reviewing what plants get put on here. And we're very specific. We only use plants that are found on the Oak Ridge Reservation, or if we're really stretching it, Ronan Anderson County. But like I said, we have a lot of plants, 1,100. Uh, different vascular plant species to choose from. So we're not actually that limited. Um, and so here we got purple cone flower, we have black eyed Susan, spotted gila, and Virginia sweet spire. And probably my favorite example of pollinator habitat is the swan pond or the East Campus Pond. Um, this picture that was on my title slide and that poster outside was actually taken here. Uh, at the Swan Pond by an ORNL employee, and that was taken on um, what's called uh, compass plants. It's that really, if you've seen it, really tall yellow plant that grows on the hillside by Bethel Valley. Uh, it's a great pollinator plant. We also have milkweed. Uh, the picture to the right, we have pickerel weed is the purple flower. Um, you get some cattails in there, which I said was good for hummingbirds, and willows. Willows are actually really great for pollinators as well. Uh, 
Uh, so those were some examples on campus. Uh, and I wouldn't be much of a plant ecologist if I didn't talk even more about plants. So hopefully you guys enjoy finding out what native plants are good for what pollinators. So purple coneflower is great for butterflies and hummingbirds, and it's also very beneficial for native bees. We have prairie coneflower, which is related to the black-eyed Susan and the purple coneflower. And it's actually a larval host for two butterflies. So once again, that means that the caterpillar needs that plant in order to have its caterpillar survive. If it's not there, the butterfly won't even lay its eggs. It's also a good nectar plant for a host of different pollinator uh, insects. Ironweed. This is a really pretty plant. It's one of my favorites. It's actually like a butterfly magnet. Uh, you'll see lots of butterflies in it over the summer, and it's really good for native bees as well. Milkweed. 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 It, it's for the monarchs, but so many other insects will pollinate um, and will get nectar from this plant. Um, but you need it or one of the other native milkweeds, and there, there's a list. Uh, there's common milkweed, and this is butterfly milkweed. And there's swamp milkweed and white milkweed, and these are all good for monarchs. A New England aster, and this is one of my favorites because when everything's kind of starting to die down in the late summer and fall when plants are starting to wither up, this one's going full bloom. And it's not only a nice accent in the fall um, for us to look at, but it's also available right at a time when all these pollinators are looking for their last bits of food before, before the growing season ends. So your asters and your goldenrods, which do not cause hay fever, by the way, um, are all very uh, good for pollinators. Common blue violet. Well, I don't actually think we've specifically planted any blue violet in our gardens. It definitely grows along the riparian zone, so along stream banks and some of our more naturalized areas. So it's definitely there um, and or here on campus. And while a lot of people are out there trying to kill every last violet that grows in their yard, this is that same one, all violets are necessary for the greater fritillaries, which is a group of butterflies. So if you don't have violets, you don't have that whole group of butterflies. And so one easy way to do it is just stop trying to kill them in your yard. St. John's wort. We have a couple varieties on campus, but if you ever see one of those bushes with bright yellow flowers, check it out. There'll be all sorts of bumblebees all over it, and they're not going to sting you or bother you. They're too busy collecting the nectar. This thing uh, just attracts them like crazy. Winterberry is another shrub you'll find around campus, and it's a good one to plant in your yard as well. Um, but it's really important for honeybees. So I don't know if anybody here uh, has a hive or is in the, the master beekeeper program, but this is a good one. Um, and it's also a larval host for the elfin butterfly. Sweet spire, we actually have a lot of this on campus. There's some around the swan pond, it's around buildings. Uh, it's just an overall uh, good pollinator for multiple species or multiple pollinator plant for species. And black cherry. Sorry to throw a bunch of words on this screen, but I could not remember them all. Uh, so what I thought with black cherry was really interesting is it had this whole list of, of butterfly species that use this, this tree. So the eastern tiger swallowtail, it lays eggs individually on top of the black cherry leaves. And then you can find the caterpillars, which look like bird droppings, so nothing eats it, on top of the leaves as well. Then you have the red-spotted purple butterfly, and it lays little eggs just on the tip of the leaf. And then those, caterpill those eggs hatch, caterpillars just eat the leaves along the midrib. Uh, and then you have the coral hair streak, and it lays underneath the bark of the cherry tree. And then it chews on the flowers and the fruits. So this tree is just providing all these different habitats, all these different food sources for these different butterflies. 
and I'll tell you in a minute, but there, there's a lot more than that. Those were just kind of the ones that had specifics. And red oak, and probably, maybe not many of you actually are thinking, but Jamie, it's a wind-pollinated plant. It doesn't need to be pollinated by butterflies or bees. Probably only one person, maybe two, are thinking that in the room. <laughs> but, and you can tell by the people laughing, but um, oaks in general are very good for butterflies and other pollinators. And so why I say this is, so Doug Palamy, uh, he is a professor. He's written a lot of books about using your landscaping to promote wildlife. Um, this book here, Bringing Nature Home, uh, it's a great book uh, that kind of explains just that. The Living Landscape is his newest book, and that talks about how you can avoid just having mowed lawn and a tall tree. Uh, you really want to layer that landscape in your yard, and that'll provide more habitat for wildlife. And then it also has a great section on, uh, it'll list a plant species and then say if it's good for bees, butterflies, uh, deer, other wildlife, etc. But if you just Google bringing nature home, best bets, you will get this list. It'll take you, it has kind of a prettier, shorter version, but then it's got a whole Excel spreadsheet, and it'll tell you what your best bets are for what, species, what plant species, what native plant species to plant in your yard to bring in pollinators. Um, and this one specifically is talking about butterflies and moths, but that oak, which is Quercus genus, 534 species of butterflies and moths use that tree in some way, shape, or form. So, if you want to get more butterflies and moths, go ahead and plant, plant an oak tree. Uh, after that, you've got the black cherry. That's the one that I listed, those three butterflies and where they position their eggs on the leaves. Then you've got willow, which we have around the swan pond, birch, and poplar. Uh, and below that, the list, he does the same thing with herbaceous plants. Um, so all your herbs, so those goldenrods and asters that I talked about being great in the late part of the growing season. Super useful for pollinators. Get some of those out into the, your yard. Sunflowers, joe pie weeds, also great. And then your morning glories. Be careful with those. Some of those get really weedy and invasive. But it's a great list. I just picked the top five. Um, but it can really help you narrow down what, what, what are the best plants to put in your yard? What's gonna have the most bang for your buck? So backyard habitat. A lot of backyards look like this. And this is not habitat. So your butterflies, your moss, your bees, they're gonna like this a lot better. Now I could have stood up here and talked all, the whole time probably about how to design the landscape but it really comes down to your own personal aesthetic. What, what do you think is attractive? You might be looking at this and being like, oh, it looks like a weed patch. Or you might look at it and be like, look at those beautiful flowers. So it really depends. I mean, you can have your yard look like a meadow, or you can take what landscaping you would normally put in. I want a rose bush here, I want some tulips here, and just find a similar native plant and just replace it and still keep that very structured structured landscaping design. And so you don't have to have it look wild, but if you incorporate native plants in any way, shape, or form, you're gonna have a benefit to pollinators. So the first thing I, besides the list of all the plants that I just gave you, the key is to have native plant diversity. You want native plants, you want local genotypes if possible, and if you're interested, there are uh, native plant nurseries that focus on local native plants. You want to have a good amount of diversity. You don't just want one plant. Even though milkweed's great, you don't need to have an entire field of milkweed. You can vary it up. Get, get a bunch of plants in there. You'll help more uh, pollinator species. And especially if you're going for butterflies, you want the host plant and you want the nectar plant. You, you need both parts of the puzzle. And then you need to provide habitat. You need that shelter. Uh, 
You need those sticks, you need the non-tilled soil, you need the shaggy bark, maybe not all those, but you wanna to try to start incorporating that into your yard as much as possible. So I put this picture up because I think it's an important one because a lot of people want to help the butterflies, but when it comes to their yard, they don't want anything to touch it. I want the deer free, bee free. I don't want anything munching on my plants. I just want this plant to be there and be statuesque, but that doesn't do anything for a pollinator. If you see this as eaten leaves, you should give yourself a pat on the back. You're doing a good job. <laughs> Something to be proud of, not to be ashamed, or not to like not show your mother-in-law, oh my God, don't look at my garden. Be happy about it. Go find those caterpillars. Look at the butterflies. Um, just enjoy the fact that you're helping. Like I stated, I'm pushing native plants. There's a lot of lists out there that push some non-native plants, and a lot of them are okay. And I'm not going to say that it's necessarily bad because they're not harmful. Just remember, some of them are, and we don't necessarily know it till it's too late. All those people that planted the tropical milkweed didn't necessarily know that it was going to be harming monarchs. And then you can plant things that are invasive, and you should not do that. Now, a lot of people really love this as butterfly bush. Notice how butterfly bush, which is actually an invasive weed, has a prettier name than butterfly weed or milkweed. We tend to name our good plants weeds. So um, I think we need to rename things, but hey, they are named what they're named. But butterfly bush, invasive. And while butterflies do really like it, it does live up to its name. It, it likes, butterflies like to nectar on this plant. It's escaping into the wild. And the problem with that is then you end up with a bunch of this, which, hey, butterflies like to nectar on, but you tend to lose things like this, like the milkweeds, those native plants that the butterflies actually need and also provide nectar. So stick with the natives if you can. Other backyard tips, um, like I said, males will do this puddling to get nutrients. So think about providing habitat um, not just the food sources. Up here, if you're into Pinterest and you look at uh, like bee houses, you'll have endless ideas um, of just different, different ways people have incorporated um, holes for, for native bees, uh, all, all sorts of things. And then kind of with same as the violets that I talked about earlier, you don't have to fight the dandelions. They're actually great for pollinators. If your neighbors yell at you, just tell them you're helping the pollinators. And there's all sorts of guides and information on the internet. All you have to do, and I prefer you put in native plants and pollinator garden, um, but even if you just put in pollinator garden, you'll get tons of helpful tips. And this one is from the US Forest Service and it's called Attracting Pollinators to Your Garden Using Native Plants. And I really like this one. It has a whole bunch of these neat little tidbits about what pollinates this and what needs that. Um, but it has, let's see, Go Native is their first one. I won't point to it, I'll just I'll look at it. So Go Native, be bountiful. So have a lot of one plant. If you have a stand of milkweed, you probably won't be bothered that some of it gets eaten away because there'll be plenty left. Be showy. Pollinators tend to really like showy plants. Be homey. Uh, provide that habitat. Be gentle. Be patient. A lot of these native plants take two or so years to really get going. So they're not an annual that marigold that you plant in the ground and it's ready to go. You have to be patient. Um, just wait a little bit for it to get going. Be sunny, most uh, pollinator plants are, are sun loving, um, but you can get woodland plants as well, it's fine. Uh, so like I said, the internet has all sorts of different um, things you can look up to get more information. And there's all sorts of organizations. This is just like the tip of the iceberg. These are all part of the uh, pollinator partnership 
Uh, so if you go to po Pollinator Partnership, I think that one's a .org, um, but I'm not sure. It'll start linking you to all these, and it's kind of just this, this uh, endless possibilities of sources that you can check out. If you're looking more local, uh, Sustainable Campus Initiative, that's us. We'll, I'll have some, hopefully some links of different websites that I've really liked put up on the website. Um, you can also check out the Tennessee Exotic Pest Plant Council to find out what not to plant in your yard. And then you can check out the Tennessee Native Plant Society, who is obviously focused on native plants. Uh, how much time do I have? Okay. Um, billion, so these are just a few of the things that I really liked while searching for pollinators. Maybe some of them will be uh, of interest to you, maybe not. If you make a pollinator garden, in your backyard, you can join the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge and put your home address on the map and help help this, uh, this particular challenge actually live out. If you're really here to listen to me talk about butterflies, then you should check out the North American Butterfly Association. There's only a local chapter, I believe it's in Chattanooga, it's the Central Tennessee Basin, but they have a guideline and it talks about it only focuses on what uh, butterflies are here in Tennessee. They're focused on the central part of the state, but most of them apply here as well. And it goes through um, and lists some of the best habitat or some of the best pollinator plants. And it also is nice and lists if they're native or not native. Now, I was looking at some of the other states and they're slowly progressing to just doing native plant uh, guides, but right now, We've got this mix, but it's still a really good guide. Monarch Watch, if you need an excuse to run around with a insect net, this is what you wanna do. And you can tell people you're doing it for science and you know try not to get tangled up in thorns or trip too much, but you're doing it for science, you're tagging monarchs, and you're really um, helping us figure out how these monarchs move throughout the country. If you're really into native bees, this website had a lot of information. It kind of talks about what are mason bees, what are honey bees. Uh, if you want to learn about how uh, bumblebees pollinate, I don't know if any of you know this, but blueberries, uh, tomatoes, peppers, they all need this thing called buzz pollination. And that can only be done by a bumblebee and the bumblebee grabs onto the flower and it vibrates at this specific frequency and only that frequency will release the pollen. And that's beneficial for both the plant and the bumblebee. The bumblebee knows that it has a better chance of another insect not getting to the pollen first, and the plant doesn't have to waste time making a lot of pollen, which is, takes a lot of energy that won't be used. So it has a lot of neat facts like that. Honeybee conserv or conservancy, there's probably a lot of resources. This one seemed like a good one to start with, but there's a lot of information on honeybees out there. So by no means think this is the only resource. If you want a very overall view of all the pol insect pollinators, check out this website. Um, Attracting Native Pollinators is a book and I was gonna bring it with me, but I didn't. Um, but check that out, it's great. It helps suggest native plants. Then they also break it down by region, and you can find this Pollinator Plant Southeast Region Guide online. And I'll try to get a link to that as well. Lots of landscaping resources, uh, wild ones, not to say that Master Gardeners or Garden Club of America aren't great. Uh, wild ones is focused purely on native plants and they have great resources. And you can also certify not through wild ones, but through other organizations, you can certify your gardens as pollinator habitat, as wildlife habitat, et cetera. And if you haven't been taking a bunch of notes, and that's fine, if you want to go to this American Beauties website, it's focused all on native plants, and you can go in and say, I'm in Tennessee, I want a plant that attracts butterflies, it needs to be in dry soil, and I want it to bloom in the summer, and it'll spit out a list of native plants that'll do that. So it's a great resource so you can kind of narrow those things down in your yard. If you're like, hey, my late summer is really dull. What can I put there? Check out that website. 
And then lastly, uh, Synapse, the first step to getting native plants into your garden or your yard is to get rid of the invasives. And like I said with the butterfly bush, they're a problem because when they escape out of your yard, that threatens the milkweed or the other host plants that are necessary um, for a lot of our native pollinators. So check out Tenepsi, Tennessee Exotic Pest Plant Council. We got a lot of good guides. Um, this is a brand new one, uh, helps you identify the plants. Uh, suggestions of native plants, and these are all on the website. Well, these two are, this one will be shortly. Um, and this one, if you have a lot of exotics in your yard, like if you have Bradford pear, and you're like, man, I really wanna get rid of my Bradford pear because, well, it smells really bad and its limbs are always breaking, and I just don't like it because it's invasive, you can look it up in this guide and be, oh, service berry. That's a really good native alternative that has white pretty blooms at the same time and is beneficial. So those are some great resources. And that's all I have. Any questions? No, speechless. Yes. Um, well, the one that I mentioned, the ones I mentioned in this presentation, we have uh, butterfly weed. So that, that's the invasive, the purple plants. And also, let's see if I can go back to it. I have too many slides. You're all thinking, yes, yes, you really did have too many slides. Uh, well, tropical milkweed was one that I mentioned, and I don't think I put down the scientific name. Too much. Uh, so tropical milkweed, and I know it was uh, the black swallow wart. The black swallow wart is the one that is actually poisonous to caterpillars. Um, and this, oh, I did put the scientific down. And tropical milkweed is uh, the one that kind of delays that migration. And then just general invasives, um, I mean, there, there's a, a whole list, and I don't know how many of them are actually harmful, like poisonous, um, but a lot of them, all of them, I would say, are harmful as far as damaging the local habitat. I don't know if that answered your question, but yes. What? Oh, the, the bore into the woods and stuff? That is a good question that I don't know the answer to. I, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know how to control pests. I'm always looking to bring insects in, so I'm not, not, not the good one for that. I think I have seen that. Yeah. Google knows all. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and I don't know enough about carpenter bees specifically to know what they pollinate or you know, where they fit in our, our ecosystems. Uh, there's always that balance between natives and promoting them and you know, when do they become a pest. When a, we love deer. When we hit a deer, it becomes, you know, a problem. So where does carpenters, bees fit into there? And that, that's probably a very personal question, like how much is what bugging you? How much damage are they doing to your house? Obviously, we don't want that. Yes. Oh. Um, I think a lot of it is, is really trying to get that, that diversity. Um, and there's and the great thing about if you plant something like milkweed or these other host plants is they turn into more than just host plants. They're beneficial. Um, 
to a lot of insects later on. Uh, some of these plants, I, I took out the picture, but like the cone flowers, they're, they're great for pollinators, but then when they go to seed, they help birds um, and you know, lots of other wildlife. So, I mean, there's only so much you can do in your yard unless you have like acres upon acres. Um, but a lot of these plants are, are multi-purpose and that's the great thing about, about natives. Yeah, we go very specific um, on our campus, and that's just that's that's what we we set up. And if you ask other people what native is, they might say, "Well, it's native to the United States. It grows in Texas. Like, let's grow it here." And some of those things work. And I'm not saying that maybe something in Florida isn't equally, you know, as as good up here. But there's a couple reasons to try to focus it in as much as you can. Get even not what grows here, but something with a seed source that grew regionally in East Tennessee or, or Tennessee or Georgia, depending on how far you can go, the closer the better. Um, but the more local you can go when you're talking about native, the better chance the plant has to survive because it's adapted to this specific ecosystem. And then you never know, like when you, uh, a certain plant here compared to the same species in Kansas is going to be have a different bloom time, a little bit different uh, structure, it'll grow in different places, and that can always, if you're talking about pollinators, kind of offset the balance. They might miss it by just that little bit of window. Um, so I always suggest you try to go as local as possible, but you know, everybody takes that what is native a little a little bit different. Yes. I have, I know people who have researched or are attempting to research things with climate change, like how our population shifting. Um, I can't say that I've personally really seen that myself, but I'm not necessarily looking out there looking for it. Definitely we have, I mean, this, this season, this uh, early growing season was really weird. We had plants blooming in like January, February that shouldn't have come out whether you know that is going to be a shift that continues with climate change or whether that was a you know weird Tennessee weather um, I don't know but but I could see things like that starting to happen and I, it's something that I know researchers are really working on but me personally I haven't you know really tracked that other than hey this was out early okay any more yes Yes, and right now, I think if you go to the Orono homepage and maybe Google landscaping, I probably should have looked this up, what will actually get you there. There is a landscaping web page that I desperately need to update, and I, but it does have links to local nurseries. Um, there's one in Clinton, and that's probably the closest. And she collects seed from, from these counties, so good to go, but I'll, I'll make sure to get something and try to get something on the Sustainable Campus website as well. And I'll have something at the booth on Wednesday, so come visit the Earth Day booth as well. Is that all? Oh, yes. There is native honeysuckle. There is, and that is great. But probably what you're talking about is not. There's the honeysuckle vine, Japanese honeysuckle vine, and that is entangling the forest, and it's not good. And again, not that pollinators don't like it, but it's uh, taking over areas and disrupting native plants that we need. Um, and then there's also the invasive honeysuckle bushes as well that aren't good. But there are there are native honeysuckles. And I think those are in the uh, Tenepsi, you know, plant this, not that type of resource. And Neil's hovering.
And if you have a pen and paper or want to snap a picture with your phone, I actually uh, didn't bring enough to hand out, but I have a couple of those native plant uh, centers where you can, if you want to just chat, dot, dot, bleh, I can't talk, good thing that wasn't in the middle of the presentation. If you want to jot down those numbers or uh, an email or a website, you're welcome to take a quick look at that. <laughs>